we pray for the church of god for its fellowship mystical activities and mission activities and for all shepherds we pray that all shepherds would nevertheless god's flock and god is from false teaching and heresies we pray for our locality let there be health healing protection and peace in this vicinity bless gmi its staff and all institution under it we pray for the bbc family bless our teachers who build us and their families bless the supporting staff and their families we pray for the student body grant us wisdom to study and perform well in the exams may this community work in unity and harmony lord bless today's teacher and speak to us as we listen to your word lord hear all our supplications and answers as according to your will in faith we pray in the name of jesus amen Now I would like to invite our brothers to sing a special song. Meanwhile, offering will be collected. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yahweh Elohim created this world and uh, he was the one who created uh, the matter, the time and the space, the foundational uh, elements of this universe. The first verse of the Bible, in our Bible, in the beginning God created heaven and the earth, Barishit, Bara, Elohim, Yet Hashemayim, Vayet Ha'aras. The phrase, that particular phrase, in the beginning it represents time, and the heaven represents space, and the earth represents matter in the ancient language. All the three elements of this fundamental particle, matter, time, and earth, space, came together because you need time to create something and you need a space to keep what you are creating. So as we know, God is not part of that creation because he is the creator as the crow is not part of her nest. And Yahweh Elohim is the one who created the whole world and but he is also involving this particular world in and to it. So this uh, creation account is entirely different from the Babylonian creation account, Edomaitish, or Sumerian or uh, Egyptian creation stories. And I have also told you that time uh, the question who created God is not logical when it comes to Judaism Christian faith. Because we are not talking about any created God, the God whom we worship, we believe that He is not a created being, He is not came into being in one time, and He is the first cause and the and the unmoved mover of everything. So this evening, I want to learn with you a very small portion, again from the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 to 17. So based on the text, I have entitled my sermon as, The Tree of Life, a source to connect with the life of God. The Tree of Life, a source to connect with the life of God. Before we get into that, let us look to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this blessed evening that you have given to us. Lord Jesus, this evening we again acknowledge that you are the only true God, you are the only true Syria. Lord, as we are listening to your word, we pray that, Lord, you speak to us, Father. You know our longings, and we pray that, Lord, you minister to us individually according to our need. And we also pray that, Lord, you free the atmosphere so that your word will sprout in soon. In Jesus' name we pray. So this uh, particular text uh, is primarily talking about the tree of life. So before I get into that, let me place a question before you. When you think about the tree of life, what are some of the images that come into your mind? Probably a beautiful tree with a lot of uh, flowers and leaves, or a tree with a lot of uh, tasty fruits in it, or a beautiful garden with a tree planted in the midst of it. Anyway, let us explore what is it. So I also want to ask the question, what is this tree of life? What is this tree of life? The first biblical reference about the tree of life that we will see in the book of Genesis. We all know that. Actually, the phrase tree of life is mentioned three times in the book of Genesis that we will see in chapter 2 and also chapter 3, two, two times. All of these occurrences are given in the context of the Garden of Eden. And the tree of life is also mentioned in the book of Proverbs almost four times that you will see in chapter 3, chapter 11, chapter 13, and chapter 15. Moreover, the tree of life is also mentioned in the last book, the book of Revelation, that you will see in chapter 22. Especially chapter 22 you will see more than three times the occurrences. So the first two truths that we learn about this tree. This tree was created and planted in the garden by God. This tree was planted by our sovereign God. That you will read in Genesis chapter 2 verse 9. And out of the ground, the Lord God merged to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the tree that we are discussing, the tree of life, is planted by God in this sovereign wish. So God is the one who comes all trees to sprout. He is the cause of everything. He is the originator of everything. And we can understand from this verse that all the fruit-bearing trees before the fall of man were pleasant and 
good fruit only. Moreover, you can see three kinds of trees in this garden. All the fruit bearing trees in general, probably mangoes, guava, and whatever you, whatever the tree you like, it will be there. And secondly, the, the tree of life. And thirdly, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. At least three kinds of trees were there in the garden of Eden. So let us go a little more deeper. I just asked the question, why did God plant the tree of life? Why did God plant this special tree in this special place? You know that God is life. And God can impart that life to anyone. Then why another tree of life? Or what is this tree of life? Have you ever asked such a question? I know that most of you did not ask such a question. Let us ask that question today. And the answer is, it is God's sovereign wish. Why God planted such a tree? It is God's sovereign wish. Nowadays, the Europeans are trying to correct God. They are trying to teach God what is good and evil, what is right and wrong. If I have two buffaloes in my house, I can decide what I should do with them. I will just slaughter them or I can use them for farming. It is my wish. If I have some clay in my hand, I can make pot or whatever shape or size I want. And I can use them for the purposes that I want. It is my wish. So the sovereign God in his will planted that tree, the tree of life. Moreover, we all know that God made Adam and Eve as living beings. They have lives. And in the same way, all the animals and all the birds have their lives. They are all alive. All of them have lives. Then why this tree of life? Why this additional tree of life in the Garden of Eden? Actually, that answer I want to share with you now. It is for rejuvenating life. For rejuvenating life. I believe that the tree of life is a life flowing tree. Or it is a life rejuvenating tree for the living beings, especially human beings. Though they have a life, in order to rejuvenate or revitalize or, uh, or keep their life in a vibrant mood, they have to eat the fruit of this particular tree. For example, God can heal all kinds of sicknesses, but God gave wisdom to human beings to invent various medicines and various medical equipments. Ultimately, God is working through them. God is the source of all kinds of healing. And moreover, God is the God of love. Therefore, that is the another reason. God invites human beings to eat the fruit of this particular tree that you can read in Genesis chapter 2 verse 16. God invites human beings to eat the fruit of this particular tree. So before the fall of man, as we read in Genesis chapter 2 verse 16, God did not forbid human beings to eat from the tree of life. God only forbids to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. At the same time, rejuvenating life was not the only purpose of this tree of life. What are the other purposes? Why God planted this unique tree in the midst of the garden? I would say, it was a symbol of constant communion with God. It was a symbol of constant communion with God. God planted this particular tree in the midst of the garden so that they can have constant communion with God. Even though Adam and Eve were alive, we know that they are more than biological beings. They are not a combination of few chemical substances as evolutionists say. They are spiritual beings who would discover their deepest fulfillment in fellowship with God. They are allowed to eat from this tree so that they can, they can have a continuous fellowship, continuous communion with this creator of the universe. I imagine like this. In the Garden of Eden, the tree of life appears to have been a source of ongoing physical life. God, the source of life, imparted some of his life to this tree. And as they eat the tree, they could have communion with God. That also shows why God planted this particular tree. This tree was a reminder of humanity's dependence on God. This tree was a reminder of humanity's dependence on God. Human beings are the crown of God's creation. 
but God wants them to depend on Him for their daily sustenance. They cannot have life without depending on God. So the fullness of life in its physical and spiritual dimensions can only be maintained through obedience to this commandment. So even though they have life, if they want to continue their life in the fullest sense, they have to obey God. They have to depend on God. Maybe you can connect it with the John chapter 15 verse 4. It says, Abide in me as I abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you will remain in me. So God planted this particular tree in the midst of the garden so that they can have a dependence on God for their daily sustenance. And the other reason, probably the fourth reason, the tree reminds the responsibility to steward the life they have received. God gave them life. And they have to keep that life. In order to keep that life, they have to depend on this tree and they have to depend on God. So they have to constantly remind them that I am not the source of life. I am only the steward of the life. And God is the ultimate source of life. And final reason, Eating from the tree will eventually lead to everlasting life. Actually, God planted that particular tree in the Garden of Eden so that the first couple will live ever as they eat the fruit of this particular tree. That you can read that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, The man now become like one of us, keeping good and evil, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed him to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Probably God might have planted that tree in the middle of the garden so that the first couple will eat that, eat the fruit of that tree and they will live forever and ever. So God planted that particular tree to test the obedience of the first couple, to check whether they are taking care of what God has given them or how they are obeying God and obeying his commandments. So the presence of the tree of life shows the supernatural provision of life Adam and Eve enjoy. So keeping all this in our mind, let us look at the big picture in that you will see in Genesis chapter 2. Let us use a magnifying glass to understand what is given in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 starts with the summary description of the creation of heaven and the earth. It is not a second narrative. It is not a second creation account. It was given or it was uh, written to focus on the sixth day of creation. And we know that God is the one who created the dry land that you will see in Genesis chapter 2 verse 4. And then what God did? God created the special place called Eden chapter 2 verse 8. Then in the garden, God made a special garden for human beings. And in the center of the garden, you see the tree of life. So our God is so wonderful. He is so kind. He is so loving. So he created first dry land. Then he created a special place called Eden. Then in the Eden, God created a special garden for the first couple. And there you will see this tree of life. And we also know that this, there was no garden before, before, before creating human beings as there were nobody to take care of the garden. So Genesis chapter 2 verse 10 to 14 gives us the first, moreover, in Genesis chapter 2 verse 10 to 14 gives us the first geographical description of the world of humankind. We all agree that it is not, it is not intended to give an in-depth geographical lesson to us. But through these descriptions of the location, uh, through these descriptions, the location of the territory of Eden it can be found out unquestionably. And it is narrowed down to specific area of the globe. The verses 10 to 14 in Genesis chapter 2 give the details about four rivers in Eden and some details about the surrounding area. If you read Genesis chapter 2, verse 10, it says, Now a river went out from the garden to water the garden, went out from Eden to water the garden. So the river first waters the Garden of Eden and then flows out of the garden. This river brings life-giving water to lands thousands of kilometers in and around that area. The three, the three significant nations, Egypt, Assyria and Babylon, they all developed 
banks of these particular rivers. And we know that the entire Bible history, especially the history of Israel and the surrounding nations, are established and developed the banks of these rivers. This, with the help of archaeology and the genome study, we can locate the Garden of Eden between modern day Iran and Iraq. Now, let us jump to two big questions people ask. The first question normally people ask why the world is like this? Why there is so much of suffering? Only Bible can answer these questions. The evolution theory cannot answer such questions. Genesis chapter 3, verse 32 says, Then the Lord God said, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now let, let he reach out his hands and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. This shows that the tree of life that we have been discussing now becomes a forbidden tree. The tree of life now becomes a forbidden tree. I want to dig a little more deeper. Why the tree of life becomes a forbidden tree? Not because the first couple have eaten the fruit of this tree. Not because God was so jealous. God think that all oh, these people will be like me. So let me throw them out of the garden. No. But disobedience. They wanted to be independent. But I believe something more than that also. Let us explore why this particular tree become a forbidden tree. Up until this point, God has been deciding what is good and what is evil. For example, he declared his creation is good. And God also said, man is alone, that is not good. So our morality depending on God, God is the one who decides what is right and what is wrong. Unfortunately, the first human beings ignore God's wisdom and they use their own wisdom to understand good and evil by eating the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Now they are in a situation of terrible consequences. They wanted to have morality independent of God. They, want, they don't want to learn from God, the ultimate order and finisher of everything, the ultimate moral being. They wanted to have morality independent of God. Because of that, God sent them out from the Garden of Eden. You may ask the question, Sir, was it a right decision? I believe actually God did something good. God was so loving. That is why he cast them out of the Garden of Eden. Why God cast them out of the Eden, out of the Garden of Eden? To protect Adam and Eve and their offspring. To protect Adam and Eve and their offspring. You can see the love and the mercy of God here. Otherwise, they will continue in their immortality given by the tree of life without God. If God did not cast them out of the Garden of Eden, they will continue in their immortality without God. If so, what will happen? Their fallen state will eventually continue. They will eternally separate from God. They cannot again enjoy the fruit of the tree of life. So after the fall, God enabled human beings to die so that they can raise again through his son Jesus Christ and come back to have fellowship with God. So God actually intentionally cast them out of the garden and God also murdered them to die so that they will rise up one day and they can come back to the garden of Eden through his son Jesus Christ. So it was the mercy and the kindness of now I want to discuss something that you don't want to hear, probably something very hard to hear. Human beings are morally responsible for making the right choices. Human beings are morally responsible for making the right choices. Actually, human beings are created with the free choices to make. The fire that can make you warm can burn you also. If you are not careful, you cannot question God. Or you cannot question fire. The water that quenches your thirst can drown you also if you are not careful. You cannot blame water or the God who created water. You cannot blame the mobile phones or the chat GPT. Okay? You have to use it properly. So 
So we are created as human beings with our free will. And uh, we are not created like pets, like uh, cats or dogs to human beings. But we are created to have constant communion with God. We are created to be His children, His beloved people. That is why God created us. And God created us with a free will. You can choose whatever you want. The life and death God placed before you. You can choose either. If so, what is evil? Did God create evil? Some people would say that, oh, Reggie, your God is not good. Because you are, you are God who created the evil. Let us explore that answer. So before, before that, let me ask you this question. What is darkness? What is darkness? Darkness is the absence of light. Darkness is not a substance. You cannot create darkness. It is only possible to take out light from something. When the light goes out, darkness comes in. So there is no independent existence of darkness. So darkness is the absence of light that we need to understand. If that is the case, what is evil? I believe evil is the absence of God. Evil is the absence of God. Evil cannot or sin cannot exist independently. Sin is the absence of God. And actually God created us to do good. But the human beings, they chose to do bad because of that evil created in this world. It is through human beings evil created. God is not the author of evil. God did not create evil because since God is good, since God is holy, nothing evil comes out from God. So God created human beings with free choices. God created human beings to do only good. But they chose to do evil because of that evil slowly or that birthed into evil or sin in this world. Let us move on. The tree of life remembered that you will see in the book of Proverbs. So Israel's teachers use the tree of life imagery to create colorful metaphors. For example, they because you, they knew that the tree of life was disappeared, but they have taken the tree of life in order to explain so many uh, moral qualities. So they use the imagery, the daily wisdom. It says, Proverbs chapter 3 verse 18, she, the wisdom, is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her, those who hold of her fast and call blessed. Here you can see that, here the wisdom is personified as the tree of life. But this wisdom has nothing to do with our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of all wisdom. This is a lady wisdom, a created being, a created wisdom, or a wisdom that God has given to King Solomon. Moreover, if you read in Proverbs chapter 11 verse 30, it says, the fruit of righteousness is the tree of life. The Jewish scholars, they understood the fruit of righteousness as the tree of life. If Fruit of, if righteousness is coming out of our life, you have the tree of life. And Proverbs chapter 13 verse 12 says, when the desire comes, it is the tree of life. If you have a right desire to do something good, it is the tree of life. And Proverbs chapter 15 verse 4 says, the wholesome tongue is a tree of life. If you have a good tongue, if you have a compassionate tongue, if you, can, if you have a tongue that edifies others rather than hurt others, Bible says you have the tree of life. So in this present time, we have the tree of life. It is manifested as wisdom. It is manifested as blessings from God. It is manifesting as good desires from God. It is manifesting as good words coming out of you and me. So I believe it is a hyperlink back to God's ideal humanity that you see in Genesis chapter 2. And coming back to the last part, the tree of life replanted. So the tree of life is a physical feature that we saw in the Garden of Eden. In the same way, the tree of life is a physical feature in our future world, the new heaven and the new earth. So it will be a physical feature there. Just like that, what happened in the book of Genesis. Moreover, you can read more about this Revelation chapter 2 verse 7 and Revelation chapter 22. 
several times in the in, in uh, Revelation chapter 22, the 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 view of life appears, and, and we have read that in our responsibility. So Revelation chapter 2 verse 7 says, "To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God." God is not a miser. God is a loving God. God protected the first couple to eat from that tree of life after they have fallen because he wanted to protect them. But he will give that, uh, he will give or he will allow us to eat from the tree of life when we get into paradise. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life to our own place. And Revelation chapter 22 verses 1 to 2 says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb to the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its tall kinds of fruit. There, there is only one tree, but you can take the fruit from both sides of the river. Yielding its fruit in each month. The uniqueness of that particular tree is every month you will you will you will get different different fruits. The leaves of the tree bear for the healing of the nation. So in the new year, you will freely eat from the fruit of the same tree that nourished Adam and Eve. Let us look forward for it. So what is the takeaway from my message today? So we have only scratched the surface of the significance of this tree of life. So what can we learn more from this tree of life? The first one, the tree of life has significance in our past, present and future life. Even though we do not have the tree of life physically, through our essays, through our tongues, through our actions, we are exhibiting the tree of life. So it has past significance in the life of Adam and Eve, it has present significance in the life of believers, and it has future significance when we get into the new heaven and the earth. And the second thing, the tree of life is a symbol of perpetual dependence on God. In the Garden of Eden, God planted that particular tree there so that they depend on God for their lives. In the same way, the tree of life shows perpetual dependence of the believers in their God. And the third thing, or finally, the tree of life also represents our Lord Jesus Christ. He is with us. He is the tree of life in our present life. Even though when we get into heaven, we have God there and we have tree of life. But currently, Jesus is the tree of life for us. As we eat, as we drink from him, we are continuing in that fellowship. And he is the source of everything. Let us follow him. So in conclusion, the study has provided us with the opportunity to reflect on God's unfolding plan to restore creation and our place in it. So God is planning to restore this creation and we have a place in it. There we have the tree of life. And moreover, the tree of life has iconic importance in the broader theme of creation and fall and the restoration. The tree of life has so much importance in God's kingdom. Moreover, the freedom to eat from the new tree of life in Revelation serves as a reminder that God is God's purpose will not be disturbed by anybody. Even though Adam and Eve disobeyed God there, God's final purpose nobody can destroy. And we all will eat from the tree of life again in the new kingdom. The tree was lost and replanted. The creation was lost and will be restored. Therefore, we can look to the future with a confidence. Yes, whatever we lost, God can renew us. God can give it back. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your blessed presence that all of us would enjoy till this moment. Sovereign Lord, we want to say that we love you. There is no one like you, Father. You are the most beautiful one. You are the King of Kings and Lord of God. We want to thank you for the salvation that you have given to us. We want to thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to explore your world. Lord, we are nothing. We are just us. We have not yet learned enough to understand you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. We trust you. Lord, this evening, once again, Lord, we acknowledge you are our Father, you are our Creator. And nobody can destroy your plans, Father. 
even though the first couple disobeyed you, you have made them a provision so that they died and they could raise again through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that, Lord, you are the reality of life in our present life. Lord, once again, we bless your holy name. This day we also remember our friends, those who are writing their examination. I pray that, Lord, you be with them, bless them, and help them to do it well, Father. We also pray for our friends, those who are not keeping well, they were healing touch me upon them, Father. Please do them for your glory. Lord, as we are moving out of your holy sanctuary, you be with us, Father. Let this whole week, let the whole month we experience your presence, Father. Lord, this month we are moving to a new semester, and we pray that, Lord, let your guidance be upon us, Father. Help all, help all of us to glorify you through all of our teaching, all of our learning, Father. Once again, we bless your holy name. Send us with your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us receive the benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of the Father, and the sweet abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, thus stand abide with each one of us from the <coughs> end of our